Good evening, Council of Ukraine, Igor Wagner, honorable guests. My name is Lydia Tkuchuk, and I'm the president of the Ukrainian National Museum, where we preserve and share our heritage and cultural treasures. Dobry wieczór, szanowni hosti. Witajmy was na sierpkowaniu Wista Piatek Rokowin Tarasa Szewczenka. W siodniejszym programie wystąpi Petro Fedinski, przekładacz, autor kobzaria angielskiej mowy i Taras Janecki, bandurist z Kijewa, spił ukraińskiej mowy. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this very special evening devoted to Taras Shevchenko's 205th birthday. Tonight you will have the pleasure of listening to Taras Shevchenko's works in English, hear the sounds of the bandura strings, melodies of Shevchenko's poetry in Ukrainian, and peruse the museum-owned collection exhibition prepared by, by our curator, Maria Kunchak. Shevchenko's works dating back to 1843, portraits, sculpture of him, etc. We have in our collection over 300 books by Taras Shevchenko. Ask any Ukrainian and he or she will know that Taras Shevchenko was Ukraine's greatest poet. Shevchenko was a serf, statesman, painter, civil leader, crusader for the rights and freedom of men and women, who wrote countless poems. His timeless words have been referenced, recited, and communicated throughout Ukraine's history, even to the present time. <clears throat> and every Ukrainian American knows at least one of his verses. The Kobzar, literally translated Bard, is an iconic collection of Taras Shevchenko's poetic literary works. Tonight's Bard, will play the bandura, a multi-stringed folk and national instrument of Ukraine. Its history dates back to the seventh century. Extremely popular amongst the Ukrainian Cossacks, it was adopted by the Kobzari, itinerant blind minstrels who traveled the countryside singing epic ballads about the heroic exploits of the Cossacks. Let me introduce our artists. We have the pleasure of welcoming Ukrainian-American, Pennsylvania-born Peter Fedensky, journalist, Voice of America bureau chief, who was so inspired by Shevchenko's literary work that he embarked on a translation of Taras Shevchenko's Kobzar. Peter will introduce the first ever English translation of the entire Kobzar. However, for the sake of this evening's event, he has selected literary works dealing with the wind especially for our windy city, Chicago. Uh -huh. <laughs> we also have the pleasure of hearing from Taras Yanetsky from Kyiv, Ukraine, a famous Ukrainian bandura vir virtuoso, honored artist of Ukraine, laureate of numerous international music competitions. Mr. Yanetsky is an associate professor of bandura and kobza at the Kyiv National University of Culture and Arts. Following our presentations, feel free to look around, see what treasures we possess, and enjoy some refreshments. But please, stay away, stay far away from our books. If you are not a member of the Ukrainian National Museum, I encourage you to become a member this evening. So let's welcome our guest, Peter Fedensky and Taras Yanitsky. To set the spirit of tonight's evening, we begin our evening with Taras Yanetsky, Bandura.
Chicago. Uh, one of your locals here, I'm sure many of you know him, uh, Mirov Kodopais, wrote a very nice review about my uh, translation in the Ukrainian Weekly. And he wrote there, I've been attending Shevchenko comm commemoration since about the age of six, and yet, as much as I hate to admit it, I have never read Taras Shevchenko's Kobzad in its entirety, either in Ukrainian or English. What well, Taras has if I may say, good company, because I didn't either until I was about 58 years old. I read it in 2008. And, uh, and it's not because I didn't want to, but because I was always frustrated. There was always some word, you know, you, you know the general poems, and we've heard them at these commemorations uh, all our lives, but there were some words that I just didn't get, and as a result, I didn't understand the poem. So I said, I'm going to look up every last word in that book, and I'm going to understand the whole thing. And for example, the word kitschka. What's a kitschka? I, I had no idea. Well, kitschka is a little collar pad that's put between the harness uh, of a horse and the horse's hide, so it doesn't chafe. And then there was the word uh, obuch. I looked it up the first time, and I said, oh. And then I forgot. It appeared later in the book, and I looked it up again. Obuch is the blunt end of an axe. Well, Somebody got it over the head, and in another poem, uh, a young lady, and it's a love story, it's a, uh, it's a uh, I didn't know Shuchenko wrote stuff like this, she drove the axe into her father's chest so deep that uh, the obuch was flush with the skin. And it's like, wow, this is some story. And there's a lot of great, great stories. So that uh, Shuchenko is more than an icon. He's great literature. 
He is great literature, and that's what I learned. Um, so before I share poems about the wind, I'd like to take a few minutes in case anyone here didn't attend Shevchenko commemorations from an early age. Uh, the, poet, uh, the poet's first uh, edition of the Kozad was published in 1840 with only eight poems. Oh, I gotta turn this on. That's the first edition and that's the censor's page. Um, and in the poems, if uh, unless otherwise marked, the artwork is Shevchenko's. Now nobody quite knows how many editions of the Kubzad had been published. In 1976, there was a, a Soviet tally that said there were about uh, 110 at the time. That was just in Soviet Ukraine. So that uh, if you count pre-Soviet times and post-Soviet times in Ukraine and abroad, uh, I've asked and they say that it could easily be at least 300 and you see a number of them here. Um, now, he's phenomenally popular. In June of 1964, I'll bet uh, some of you were there, former President Eisenhower unveiled the statue to a young Shevchenko in Washington, D.C. The one in Ottawa, hardly the only one in Canada, was unveiled in 2011. There are about 125 Shevchenko monuments in cities around the world and roughly 1,250 in his native Ukraine. Now here's a sampling in far-flung capitals of the world. Copenhagen, Havana, Moscow. Paris, Tashkent, no, I'm sorry. Beijing, Budapest, Buenos Aires, then Copenhagen, uh, Havana, Moscow, and finally Paris, Tashkent, and Warsaw. Now, during the Maidan protest five years ago, Shevchenko was dubbed the spiritual hetman of the Maidan. But despite the poet's phenomenal popularity uh, among Ukrainians across the cultural and political spectrum, I met three journalists there who failed to notice his ubiquitous presence. One of them was German, another Chinese, and the third was a photographer for a major <coughs> American newspaper. Now, here is what uh, those journalists failed to appreciate. A Shevchenko portrait uh, overlooking the Maidan draped uh, from the burned out trade unions building. Shevchenko's portrait was on the stage of the Maidan at all times. Not necessarily the one you see there, but uh, there was always a Shevchenko portrait there. Uh, the first victim of government snipers was Serhii Nihuyan, a uh, Armenian Ukrainian who was recorded reciting a Shevchenko poem shortly before his, he was shot by government snipers. The video went viral, and this photo appeared throughout the Maidan, often next to Shevchenko. The poet's portrait was on and in many of the tents on the Maidan. And Shevchenko was depicted uh, carrying a tire to throw in the Maidan's defensive ring of fire himself. Some fancied him as a uh, pop culture sort of uh, king of Ukraine or a superhero. Shevchenko was also portrayed in religious terms as a Christian icon or a Jewish rabbi. Others placed a statue in prominent places on or near the Maidan, and when I spoke with the American photographer, we were standing about 50 feet away from the, uh, the wooden statue on the right, um, which was being carved one stroke at a time by passers-by under the guidance of the sculptor who did the face. Now, last month, this series of posters appeared at the Taras Shevchenko subway station in Kiev under the auspices of the Metro Authority, and the National Shevchenko Museum. <coughs> Last year, passengers got a free ride on the uh, cave metro if they could recite one of his poems on his birthday. The exhibit meant to further popularize Shevchenko was to have lasted through this Sunday, but a, a man defaced him, them with a knife saying that such pop depictions demean his stature as a national genius. Now, whatever one thinks of such, such depictions, it is clear that Shevchenko remains relevant and extremely popular. I believe that promoting him and Ukrainian culture in general is vitally important because otherwise, journalists can unwittingly buy the Russian line that Ukraine has no culture worth sharing 
and that the only thing that Ukraine offers is war and corruption. We know that's not true. Now, the Kobzad helped galvanize the Ukrainian identity and can serve as a guide to long submerged, even prohibited elements of Ukrainian history, geography, personalities, and folklore, and also to universal theme, such, themes, such as love and lust, charity and greed, grace and envy, hope and despair, the meek and the mighty, freedom and oppression, and finally, the beauty of life that radiates throughout much of the darkness and suffering that Shevchenko witnessed and expressed in the Kobzad. The poems take the reader on an expansive journey with stops on the shores of some 30 rivers in Eurasia and the Middle East, including the Dnipro, the Don, the Dniester, and the Danube, the Sen, Yenisei, the Jordan, the Karabutak, and Kayala, from the Alta to Jotivode. To help the reader understand the geographical, cultural, historical, and political context of the poems, I, trans I uh, included about 570 short footnotes uh, to help, uh, help the reader along. Shevchenko's writing is terse, yet expansive. His Kobzad is a tightly woven tapestry of landscapes, ideas, images, and personalities, both historical and fictional. I could do a reading on any of the threads, Love, patriotism, religion, brotherhood, the sun, trees, vanities, nature, burial mounds, rivers, battles, colors, and more. But, this being the Windy City, I'll focus on the wind. I counted 44 poems in the Kobzad, uh, in the nearly 240 poems in the Kobzad, in which Shevchenko refers to the wind. In fact, it appears in the very first sentence of the very first poem, The Mad Maiden. The mighty Dnieper roars and groans, an angry wind resounds. It bends tall willows to the ground. It raises waves like mountains. A pale moon just then peeked through the passing clouds, and like a boat in azure seas, it rolled and pitched across the sky. Third roosters had not crowed, and nowhere was a soul astir. The owls called out across the grove, at times an ash tree creaked. The wind, later in the poem, dies down, and the heroine is driven mad, believing that her Cossack lover may have died on a foreign battlefield. The mighty Dnieper fell silent. The wind blew away all the dark clouds and lay down to rest alongside the sea. The moon shines so bright brightly from heaven above, or waters, or forests, amid silence all round. There are instances where the wind is used to help, or rather these are instances, where the wind is used to paint the scene of a poem. Shevchenko wrote The Mad Maiden in 1837, a year before he gained his freedom. This is uh, Shevchenko's Emancipation Certificate, which is just a fancy name for a receipt for the purchase of a human being. The poet was born a serf like millions of his fellow Ukrainians. He knew what it was like to be the property of another person and expressed it in the Kobzai. One of his early poems, Katerina, was written in memory of the day of his emancipation, April 22, 1838. It was dedicated to Vasily Zhukovsky, a poet and tutor of future Tsar Alexander II. His portrait was auctioned off by a group of Ukrainian and Russian intellectuals to purchase Shevchenko's freedom and uh, it was bought by the family of Tsar Nicholas, the autocrat who subsequently sent Shevchenko into a decade-long exile as a soldier on Russia's Asian frontier, supposedly for writing poetry that was deemed subversive. Katerina tells the tragic story of a Ukrainian village girl who fell in love with a Russian officer. Her face became scorched by the sun and swayed by winds like a lonely field flower. After, the Russian broke his promise to return to her from a deployment, leaving her with a baby boy. Note the image that Shevchenko paints uh, with words in this excerpt. Beneath the peak along a valley, oak trees from the Hetman's days stand tall and proud like wise and elders. The valleys damned 
willows cued, the ponds imprisoned under ice, and an ice hole to fetch water. The sun reddens like a child's hoop and blazes through a cloud. The wind picks up, it blows. Then there's nothing. It's a whiteout. It's swept throughout the woods. Now, baby in hand, Katerina meets her lover's unit. He pretends not to recognize her and spurs his horse away, leaving her unwed, alone, ostracized, and despondent. She emerges at the forest edge, looks around, then toward the valley, running, stopping on the pond in silence. Take my soul, dear God, and you my body. Splash into the water. Beneath the ice, a rumble spread. Dark-browed Katerina found what she was seeking. The wind blew across the pond. Not a trace was left. It's not the wind. It's not the rage that breaks the mighty oak. It's not trouble nor much, hard, nor much hardship when a wedded mother dies. The children aren't quite orphaned when they've buried their dear mother. They are left with good repute, and a tomb remains as well. <clears throat> Whenever evil people mock the orphan, it can cry its eyes out on the tomb. Its little heart can rest. But what remains for him? For him upon this world whose father's never seen him and whose mother left him. What's the bastard left with? <laughs> Who will talk with him? Neither family nor a home. Roads, sands, anguish. Shevchenko knew more than a little about roads. Shown here are all the places he, the poet visited in Ukraine as an artist on an archaeological exhibit. Uh, exhibition documenting landmarks, <coughs> burial mounds, traditions, and songs. And the sum of that, uh, uh, his experiences there, were published in a collection called Tregita, and you, that's the last book on that table, and that's where his meatiest poems are, Kaukaz, uh, Rosarita Mohela, he saw the ruin of Ukraine and he tried to deliver that, and that was what was censored by uh, the Tsar, they grabbed it, uh, held it, and uh, there was some Vidav, uh, or a, uh, handwritten copies, that ended up in Prague, where the Prague Kobzad was published. But the Tsar didn't release those poems until 1906. So Shevchenko was then sent into deep exile in Kazakhstan, more than 1,700 miles from his home in St. Petersburg as the crow flies. Shevchenko wrote about the desolation he felt there on the shores of the Aral Sea where he spent a portion of his 10 years in exile. The skies unwashed, the waves are spent, and reeds, devoid of wind, still sway like much, a, like much, uh, still sway much like a drunkard all along the shore. Oh, my dear Lord, how much more am I to roam the world along this useless sea and in this open jail? Silent is the yellowed grass, which sways amid the steppe as if it were alive. It does not wish to speak the truth, but there's no one else to ask. Shevchenko makes frequent use of anthropomorphism, that is, attributing human qualities to nature. Willows, for example, lean to eavesdrop on the sweet nothings of a couple making out late at night in the Heidemachs. Also in that poem, the moon watches people's actions and tells God about it in the morning. A chapel converses with the Deep Row River in The Dream, one of the three poems of the same title. In one of his very early poems, a girl, distraught over the apparent loss of her beloved Kozak at sea, summons the wind to help find him. Raging wind, oh raging wind, you talk with the wind, awaken it and play with it, ask the azure seas. It knows where my sweetheart is because it carried him. Yes, the azure sea will answer where it's hidden him. If it drowned my sweetheart, blow the sea apart. I'll go find my sweetheart. I'll go drown my sorrow. I'll drown all my misfortune and turn into a nymph. I'll search among the dark, dark waves. I'll sink down to the bottom. I will find him. I'll embrace him and swoon upon his heart. Then, O oh wave, carry my darling with me wherever the wind may blow. 
If my sweetheart's on a distant shore, O raging wind, you know where he walks and what he does. You talk with him as well. If he's crying, I cry with him, and if not, I sing. If my dark brown one has died, then I shall die as well. So take my soul to him, to my dearest sweetheart. Place it on, him, on his grave as a crimson gilder rose. It will ease the orphan's rest in a foreign field. As a flower above him, his beloved will grow. As a flower and a gilder rose, I will bloom above him. So the foreign sun will scorch so that no one treads upon him. Evenings I will grieve for him, and mornings I will cry. I'll dry my tears at sunrise, they'll be seen by no one. Raging wind, oh raging wind, you talk with the sea, awaken it and play with it. Ask the azure sea. The poem, The Drowned Maiden, begins with an anthropomorphic wind, whispering a question about a mystery at a haunted lake. There. Envy drives a promiscuous widow to drown her kind and decent daughter, to whom Kozak, Kozaks, as Shurchenko put it, cling like hop vines in a field. I'll read the first section in Ukrainian so you can hear how the poet uses onomatopoeia to simulate the sound of the whispering wind. Vítr v háji nehojáje, v noči spočeváje, prokinice tichásinko vosoky pitáje. Kto se, kto se, po sim boci, češe kosu? Kto se, kto se, kto se, po tim boci, rve na sobi kosu? Kto se, kto se, te hesenko spetaje, povije, taj zadrima, poke neba kraj začervonije? Kto se, kto se, spetaje te cigavi jevčata? Oto dočka, po sim boci, po tim boci, i... Mate. The wind's not dancing in a forest. At nighttime, it's at rest. Awakened, it whispers to the sedge. Who's this, who's this on this side that's combing her long braid? Who's this, who's this that's on, side, that's on that side, ripping out her braid? Who's this, who's this, it asks quietly, wafting, dozing off till the edges of the sky turn red. Who's this? Who's this? A question all you curious girls may ask. On this side, it's a daughter. On the other, it's her mother. In one of his poems, Shevchenko uses the word buinasinki for the wind, which means blustering or perhaps boisterous little wind. It also underscores the virtual impossibility of translating the poet's light and effort effortless eloquence into any language. The loving tenderness of the original word is not derived from its meaning, but from the diminutive of an adjective that Shevchenko uses as a, noun, as a noun that gains meaning through context, and that's a very heavy lift for a translation. I don't know of any English diminutives for wind, much less the adjective boisterous. Tenderness is inherent in the very nature of the Ukrainian language which allows for diminutives of most nouns, adjectives, and even adverbs. English can't do that. Wind is wind. The, wind, uh, the word for wind in Ukrainian can be uh, vite, can become vitrik, vitreks, vitrenko, vitrenenko, and there's probably more. Now, Shevchenko's friend and first Russian translator, Alexei Plyshchev, wrote about the difficulties to novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, he wrote, I recently translated Shevchenko's poem, The Hireling, Naimichka. I don't know how the translation came out, but the original is a wonderfully poetic thing. It's so hard to translate. It's simple, simple, natural, and straight from the heart. Incredibly so. Now, translators are often faced with the choice between aesthetics and meaning. Noted Shevchenko translators, Konstantin Andrusyshin, Watson Kirkkanal, and Vera Rich, tried to render Shevchenko's lyricism. My translation focuses on the content, which is, I believe, to be as compelling as his poems are lyrical. I use the basic Anapest meter to at least give the poems a readable cadence. 
So here is that blustering little wind conversing with the burial mounds. And uh, that's Taras Yanitsky. Uh, he just sang that song. <laughs> <laughs> Bandurist, O Grey Eagle, you've got it good, my brother. You have wings and you have power and there's time to fly. Now you fly to our Ukraine. They await you there. I'd fly after, but who would welcome me? Here I'm foreign and alone, and in Ukraine, my dear one, I'm an orphan, just like here. The heart pounds, it longs, but why? I'm alone there, all alone. Ah, Ukraine, the boundless steppes. The boisterous breeze will blow. He'll speak up like a brother. There's freedom in that open field. There the blue sea praises God. It dispels the longing. Mounds amid the steppe converse there with the blustering wind. They converse in sadness, and here is what they say. Twas once, tis gone, never to return. I'd fly, I'd listen, and I'd cry with them, but fate, alas, has clipped my wings among a foreign people. Shevchenko nonetheless communicated with Ukraine, and his messenger of choice was the wind. The next ex excerpt is the one from is one from the Caucasus, a poem that begins with the figure of Prometheus. He serves as a backdrop to Shevchenko's monument in Washington, D.C. It's a poem written in 1845 about the Russian invasion and occupation of Chechnya, and it remains relevant. The Caucasus is dedicated to Shevchenko's friend Yakiv de Balman, who illustrated the transliteration of Shevchenko's Kobzar into the Latin alphabet. De Balman was killed on a Russian mis military mission in uh, the Caucasus, and here, the poet focuses on the collaboration between the rulers of Russia and the Russian Orthodox Church and counts on the wind to communicate with his deceased friend. Shrines, chapels, icons, smoke of myrrh and candelabras, an unflagging bowing before your sacred image. They implore for theft, for war, for blood, to spill a brother's blood. And then they gift you with an altar cloth, stolen from a burning ruin. Now here is Russia speaking. We're enlightened, and still we want to bring enlightenment to others, to share the light of truth, you see. With children that are blind, we'll show you everything. Just let us take you by the hand. How to lay the bricks for dungeons, how to forge some shackles, and how to wear them, too. How to how to weave a knotted whip. We'll teach you everything. Just give us all your azure mountains, for we've now seized the field and sea. They drove you too, my dear good friend, my one and only Yaku. You came to spill your good pure blood, not for Ukraine, but for her executioner. You had a drink of Moscow's poison from the cup of Moscow. Oh, my good good friend, my unforgettable dear friend, May your living spirit spo uh, soar above Ukraine. Fly with Cossacks o'er the shores. Guard the dugout mountains that stand amid the steppe. Shed fine tears with Cossacks, and in that steppe, please wait for me as we break our bondage. But for now, I'll sow my thoughts in raging anguish. Let them grow and with the wind converse. The gentle wind will mix my thoughts with dew, and they'll reach you from Ukraine. You, my friend, will welcome them. You'll read them with a brother's tear, and you'll recall the mountain step, you'll recall the sea and me. The Windy City should be proud of what is probably the most famous edition of the Kobzad outside of Ukraine. It was part of a 14-volume complete works of Taras Shevchenko published here between 1959 and 1963 uh, by a man some of you may have known, Nikola Denisyuk. Mr. Denisuk was a friend of my parents, and I met him a few times as a boy. Here's a photo when he hosted our family here in Chicago. The 10-year-old kid is me. Now, who would have guessed then that I would refer to Mr. Denisuk's uh, edition for a paragraph from the verse uh, from a poem uh, called The Aspen, which Shevchenko reworked into a poem that is now known as The Witch. There are two <coughs> versions of The Witch. 
I also used the Ukrainian translations Mr. Denisyuk published of the only two poems in the, the Komsar that Shevchenko wrote in the Russian language. Uh, I did that to un double check my understanding of the original. Here's the beginning from one of those poems, The Blind Woman. As I weep, who is there for me to summon that would share my pain, my longing? Whom am I to serenade with my lovely native song in a distant foreign land? I'll expire poor in bondage. With silent walls around me, I share the pain and longing for my one-time freedom, one-time fortune. O sacred winds, if you could hasten to the bosom of my native land with my lament of sorrow, with the clank of rusted chains. And then repeat the sounds in that peaceful shrine where my father and my mother caressed and gave me love. Those words are based on the biblical story of Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers. The Kuzad is infused throughout with the spirit of the Bible, which was Shotenko's lifetime companion from childhood through his first days of freedom, then imprisonment and exile. He began a number of poems with citations from the Bible, and several verses are based on various chapters of the Holy Book. Ezekiel, Hosea, Isaiah, and the 11th Psalm. He also wrote a collection of poems entitled the Psalms of David. Here is his rendition of the first psalm, in which the wind is a mechanism for scattering that which is dead. The blessed man won't join an evil council. He won't go the way of sin, nor will he sit beside the scornful. His head and will instead draw lessons from the law of God. He'll bear abundant fruit like a greening tree beside the water planted in a fertile field. Thus that man in his goodness ripens, but all trace is lost of the evil and impious like ashes scattered round the earth by the wind above. And the evil will not rise from coffins to stand beside the righteous. Deeds of the good shall flourish. Deeds of the wicked will expire. Heidemach, Shevchenko's longest poem by far, begins with a philosophical setup in which the wind sweeps away the past and the future continues in a cycle as old as time. All is passing, all is fleeting, forever without end. Whither goes it? Whence? Neither fool nor wise man knows. Living, dying, one thing blossoms, one thing wilts. It wilts for all eternity. And winds have swept the yellow leaves. But the sun will rise as always. And red stars that always drifted will later drift as well. And you, the pale moon, will rise to dance upon the blue, blue sky. You'll rise to gaze upon the trough and well, upon the endless sea. And you'll shine as you once did in Babylon, above its hanging gardens, and will, above our suns and all the twists of fate. After I published the book, a friend asked me to open it to any page and to read whatever was on it. It happened to be a poem called The Plague. My friend said he had no idea Shevchenko wrote poems like that. As he put it, they didn't teach that us. They didn't teach us that in Ukrainian school. The wind in this poem sweeps away all traces of the past. It was written in 1848 in Kosaral, Kazakhstan, based upon reports of a cholera epidemic around Orenburg, where Shevchenko had begun his exile. The plague meandered with a spade, digging, digging graves, stuffing them with corpses, corpses, and not singing of the saints. Be it city, be it village, it sweeps up like a broom. It's spring, the orchards bloom. They're like a tapestry, a wash with God's dew, a wash and sparkling with God's dew. The earth is happy. It prides itself with blossoms, shaded groves and orchards. But poor people in the village, like a flock of frightened sheep, are locked inside of houses, dying. Moaning oxen roam the streets with hunger, and horses graze in gardens, but no one comes to chase or feed them, as if the people were asleep. Indeed, they're sleeping. 
For it's been long since bells have, uh, they've forgotten sacred Sundays, for it's been long since bells have rung. Absent smoke, the chimneys mourn, beyond the orchard, past the fence, virgin, somber graves. Between the houses by the orchards, cloaked in tar and leather, sextons chain the corpses to drag them past the village gate. Then they cover them without, without a coffin. Days go by, months go by. Evermore, the village will be silent. It's now still. All is overgrown with nettle. The sextons laid beside the houses. From those houses, no one came to bury their poor souls as well. And so they rotted by the houses. The village in an open field turns green like an oasis. No one enters, just the blowing wind that scatters yellowed leaves across the golden field. Greenery lingered in the village till people from the field sparked a blaze, burning down the verdant village. It burned and smoldered, then wind dispersed the ashes, not a trace remained. Such was the grief created by the plague. One of Shevchenko's last poems reminds me of the slow reform process in contemporary Ukraine. We'll see how it all plays out in the upcoming election. Um, it condemns rogue Ukrainian leaders who serve hostile foreign interests, but sounds a note of optimism that in the end, they will be gone with the wind. There were wars and army feuds, the Galagan Kisils and Kochubeina highs. Of such ilk, there was a lot. All has passed, but not yet vanished. Woodwards still remain. They gnaw, devour, and decay the ancient oak. But lovingly and quietly, greenery and shoots are pushing from the roots. And, they, and when they grow, even with no ax, there will be roars and groans. A Cossack with no horse will pounce. He'll smash the throne, rip the mantle, and your idle human woodworms he will crush, nannies and master servants of a foreign fatherland. Your sacred idol will not last, nor either will you last. Weeds and nettles, nothing more above your corpse will grow. Foul manure will build in heaps. The wind will wear away those heaps. And we, not rich, not poor, will freely pray to God. To better appreciate Shevchenko's poetry, the reader needs to understand that he was a very accomplished painter, painter and master engraver. His main instrument was not the word, but the eye. And it is evident from the uh, visual and even cinematographic images in his poetry. I urge you to read about that in uh, the introduction in the book by Lesik Generayuk of the uh, Literature Department at the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. Um, her, her piece is called Shevchenko, the artist as poet and poet as artist. I'll conclude with a five and a half minute sampling of images from the gift edition of the translation. You'll see Shevchenko's documentation of Ukrainian churches and countryside, his sketches, people, places he saw in exile, Kazakhs, and portraits. And accompanying our uh, slides will be our old gray eagle, the Bandurist Tarasianitsky. So um, as he gets set up, and then I'll press the button. And this, by the way, is the, uh, the gift edition. This, uh, uh, I'll tell you in the end where uh, you can acquire that. It, uh, unlike the uh, standard edition, this has um, 125 images, color images. And it's, uh, if I dare say, it's a nice book. It has simulated leather, has a, uh, a marker, keep your place. And uh, it was printed by uh, it, it was printed in uh, the Netherlands by a company that specializes in
of that. So Danas will be back in a minute. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming. The book, the gift edition is available on glagoslav.com. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty pricey, but uh, I think it's a beautiful book. Uh, and the, uh, the standard edition is hardback and paperback on Amazon. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, the museum, uh, you for coming, whoever prepared uh, the, uh, the snacks to come, and, uh, the exhibit. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you enjoy the book. Thank you. що мені дуже приємно знаходитись тут і дякую дуже за запрошення. От, е, я хочу ну, пару слів поділитися, сказати, що е, буквально тиждень назад я представляв Мадуру в Лос-Анджелесі в дуже таких потужних, сильних залах. І грав і сольно, і з оркестром, і американці надзвичайно класно приймали наш інструмент і давали най, найвищу характеристику йому. От, от, такої радісті. І перед цим, як ви зрозуміли, прозвучав такий національний репортаж і така невеличка американська родзинка. Хочу вам подарувати і думаю, що ви пізнаєте цей твір. Взяв би я Мадуру або де Крим за горами.
І зараз хочу запропонувати знаєте, такий імпровізаційний крок, щоб відійти трошки від академізму, заспівати всі разом. Я думаю, що багато хто знає кожен втіливу пісню про кохання «Ой, ти любко моя з Коломиї». «Ой, ти любко моя з Коломиї». Тебе ручки білі чи вітчиста, Твої очі чарують пів міста. Ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-
українцям, вже які ми живемо в Америці. Тому що е, слово звучало Шевченкове із уст е, людини, яка народилася в Америці, яка перенесла це Шевченкове слово в англійську мову, щоб воно стало зрозумілим американській публіці. І з другої сторони е, Шевченко завжди асоціюється з кобзарством, з кобзарями. І ось цей кобзар сучасний у фраку бере бандуру, їде в Лос-Анджелес і виступає перед величезною аудиторією. Він отримає гранд-прі у Парижі на найпрестижнішому всесвітньому фестивалі арфістів, граючи на бандурі. Ось перед нами сучасний кобзар у фраку. Це є Тарас Яницький, який несе українську музику, українське слово несе у світ. І, як ви вже зауважили, що ми часто оголошення наші розміщуємо на Фейсбуку, бо ми хочемо теж бути модерними, щоб нас бачили, читали, чули. І була така одна фраза, я не знаю, чи навіть Тарасові вона сподобалася, але я написала, що це людина, що це бандурист, що це ковзар, і що це заслужений артист України, який насамперед сам до вас дзвонить, сам проситься, сам пише «Прийміть мене, прийміть його, подякуємо за те, що є такий хлопець у світі, який несе українську культуру у просто у всесвіт, це без перебільшень, він вітає сам з тим, що ви його почули». І його світ почує, і так світ сприймає Україну, і так світ сприймає Шевченка. І тому не даремно сьогодні пан Петро демонстрував сучасного Шевченка, сучасні слайди, які ми не сприймаємо, як покоління, яке виросло на Шевченкових, Шевченковій поезії, Шевченкових творах. Проте він живе, і сьогодні ми дякуємо панові Петрові за те, що ви з нами, за те, що ви є. За те, що ви також напросилися, бо ви також дзвонили часто, ми хочемо мати презентації такі, ми хочемо знати людей, але не завжди співпадають можливості з бажаннями. І тому ми дуже вдячні, що ви подаєте такий день, коли сам Шевченко сходить до нас своїм промінням, торкається і каже, ви тут, бо це ваш дім, це ваша світлиця. Дякуємо за те, що ви з нами. Я думаю, що буде... Як завжди, ми повинні заспівати заповіт.